Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word. And we're thankful, Lord, for what you have provided for us for our salvation. Many times, Lord, we take you for granted. But we're asking, Lord, that we will begin to understand the sacrifice that all of heaven made to save us. And we pray, Lord, that you'll stand in this room and pour out your spirit upon our hearts that we may be able to comprehend what is to be said. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when I started this study, I wanted to discuss um, Daniel, first two chapters. And we are going to talk a little bit about Daniel. But this is what happened to me. This is, it happens to most people who are studying the Word of God. God then directs you somewhere else. Because the more I studied one thing, I had questions about another. And so I had to go back and study more and more and more to understand what I was trying to understand, if you know what I'm saying. So the topic is God's people. Now, you're God's people, right? You belong to God, right? At least I hope you acknowledge that within your head. But a lot of times we don't know what really that means. We're going to, today, we're going to start in the third chapter of Daniel. Most of us are familiar with this story. There's going to be a little bit of information that I'm leaving out. And I'll, that's your assignment to read later on. Um, let's get started. Daniel chapter 3. This story is about King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. This image was actually an image of himself. I know I'm going backwards, but in chapter 2 it explains what this image is. When he, he had a dream, God showed him the dream, and God showed him who the head of this man that was in this dream was, and it was him. It was him. But you go to chapter 3, and he's building an image now. And this image, let's, let's, let's read about it. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together to, to the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the ministrates, and all the officials of the province to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now, if you, if you look at that list of people who were on the invite list, there were no common people. There were all governors and, and people in charge of something. So... Obviously, King Nebuchadnezzar had a, an intention here. He was going to talk to those who were under him. You see, all the kings worried about being overthrown. And he wanted to make it clear that he was not going to be overthrown. Did I tell you that this image, 66 cubits, um, a cubit is equal to 17 to 19 inches. You multiply that by 66 and you divide it by 12, which is a foot. That's over 100 feet tall. And this is solid gold. It said it was 10 feet wide. So he made this image of himself 100 feet tall. And he invited all the officials. And, he, and listen to what he says. Verse 4. Then a herald cried out aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horns, flutes, harps, lyrics, sorcery, symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Verse 6. And whosoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately 
to the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Would that make you a little nervous? Okay, I'm inviting you to a program. I want you to worship. If you do not worship, I will kill you. That is, in essence, what he was saying. He was saying that he was, you worship me or you die. Verse 7. So at that time, when all the people heard the sounds of the music, they fell down and worshiped this gold image. But not everybody had their head down. It appears that there were some uh, Chaldeans who were kind of looking around to see if everybody was bowing. And there were three guys who were still standing. Three guys. Who were these guys? So they kind of got up and went over to the king and said, Oh, king, live forever. I don't know why they always tell the king to live forever. None of them did. You, O oh king, have made a decree that whoever hears all these different instruments would fall down at the sound of the music and worship this image. But listen to what they said. Verse 12, there are certain Jews who you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regards to you. They do not serve your God or worship the gold image which you have set up. Now, why do you think these men reported uh, these three boys? They must not have been more than 2021. It was, if you go, we're, and we're going to do this. Uh, the first chapter of, Babylon, uh, of Daniel kind of gives us an idea about their age. They were teenagers when they were brought. They were made eunuchs. They spent three years in study. So about 2021, they were, they were promoted. Now, we're going we're gonna to go back. We're going to see why they were promoted. But here is the scenario here. They're worshipers of the true God. And now they have a, they have a problem. Because God has said, thou shalt not have no other God before me. And this king has says, this king has said, you either worship me or die. Let's read on. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they brought these men before the king. Now, this kind of tells you, and we're going to read this, that Nebuchadnezzar recognized them. Because when Nebuchadnezzar interviewed them when they first got there, they were ten times wiser than everybody else. That's how they got promoted. So he recognized who they were, and it's almost like he said, okay, I'll give you a second chance. So let's read. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, It is true, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my God or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time, you hear the sound of the horns, flutes, harps, lyrics, psalmistry, symphony, with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made good. Now, you can envision his expression changing now. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And his, listen to this. And who is the God who will deliver you from my I would say that this is a life-threatening issue, and it's a big dilemma. But now I want to skip to the book of Revelation. Revelation, uh, chapter 13. Now, in order for me to really um, 
There may be some who may not understand everything that I'm going to read here. But the gist of it is verse 30, 13. We're going to talk about images and symbols and signs, but that isn't the gist of this sermon. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. But you will have to go back and study it yourself. And someday we'll, we'll cover it again. The first nine verses talks about actually the period of Daniel, that time period. It talks about this beast coming out of the sea, and this beast having uh, seven ho heads and ten horns, and, and this beast looking like, uh, uh, like a bear, like a, a leopard, and, and a lion. And all these symbols comes out of Daniel. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because, in essence, we would have to spend a whole sermon on this. There's a point I'm trying to make. This image gave, received its power from the dragon, and the dragon is Satan. Verse 4, so they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like the beast, who is able to make war with him? And this beast was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Now I'm going to jump to verse 11. I'm skipping a lot. We can look at that later. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spoke like a dragon. According to our studies, this is our time. That somewhere in the future, there's going to be an image that comes out of dry land, looking like, speaking like a lamb, but speaking like a dragon. Sorry, looking like a lamb, but speaking like a dragon. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because this image is going to compel, well, let me read it. And he deceived those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Somewhere in the future, somewhere in the future, there's going to be a decree that's going to require you and me to worship someone other than the true God. And the penalty of that will be death. What we're doing is now we're comparing the Old Testament time to the New Testament time. This sermon is about the people of God. And that's who we are. But what about the people before us that came? We're going to look, we're going to go back, and we're going to look and see how they compare. Because what we're going to discover is that their journey is the same journey that we're on. And the same experience that they had will be the same experience that we have. Okay? So that's all I'm going to do with Revelation. We're going to go back now. We're going to back, go back to Daniel. And we're going to go to Daniel chapter 1. And it's going to give us some information here. It says, Daniel 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged us. This is not new. God's people have always been attacked by those who don't believe in God. That will happen till the end of time. So that doesn't bother me. Verse 2 bothers me. It says, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. I I'm going to read that again. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, who was the king of Judah, into his Nebuchadnezzar's hand. Two with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, 
to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. So I had a question. How did that, how did that happen? Why would God allow his people to be overcome by a heathen king? Okay. And two, in those days, you know, nations fought against nation. They overcame nation. And they then took the God of that nation and took it to their temple to be subordinate to their God. So it says the Lord allowed this to happen, number one. Number two, remember Solomon's temple? All the beautiful things that were in it, the gold, the all, the all the things that were for worship, they took all of that and took it to Babylon and, to, and put it in their God's temple. But what did that mean? Babylon was saying, my God is stronger than your God. I was able to defeat you. So my God is stronger than your God. And I, had a, I, just, I just couldn't get my head around that. Why would God allow that? doesn't make any sense to me. So then I, I had to go back and study some more. I had to look beyond that. So I went back to the beginning of when God called his people. And that's Genesis 12. In Genesis 12, that's the call of Abraham. He was called Abram then. But listen to what God says. For It, is, it appears that since creation, God has been trying to develop a group of people that were his own. You know, um, he, he uh, started off with Set and Group. Those are the sons of God. And then Cain's group, those are the children of men. And the, they were supposed to override the sons of men, but it didn't happen that way. The children of men overrode the children of God, and pretty soon everybody was wicked. So he had to destroy everybody. Then there's eight people that he starts over again. Eight people committed to him. And they produce, and they have a big nation and everything. And before you know it, they're worshiping idols again. They're, they're disobedient to God. And so here, here we have in Genesis 12, God is calling Abram out of his family. Let's read this. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. Why would God make Abram a great nation? What was the purpose of that? I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And this is the part that I think we need to focus on. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, we naturally think, well, Jesus, Jesus came from that lineage. Oh, yeah, so all the earth was blessed. But we need to look at that a little more because God had a purpose. He wasn't just picking a group of people so that he could call his own and let everybody die. He was picking a people who would represent him. But the goal also was that they would represent him to the world. His goal was to save everybody. That has always been his plan. Sometimes we read the Old Testament, we think God just had a special people. You know, we were grafted into the plant. You know, you've heard that, right? But no, God from the beginning planned on the Gentiles to be saved. And when, when he couldn't get, when he, he tried it several ways and he said, okay, I have my own people. And we get this, and I'm going to show you, this, this was his plan. In Genesis 18, down the road, 25 years later, you know, he's coming to Abraham and saying, I'm going to give you a son. Abraham's 100. 
you know, Sarah's 75. And he says, I'm going to give you a, a son, and in him all the, all the world would be blessed. Again, not just a Messiah. Everyone was supposed to know who God was. He says this again, Genesis 22. And in Genesis 22, this is the story of Abraham with Isaac going up to the mount. He was going to sacrifice Isaac because God had told him to. And then when he, when he had him up there on the mount, he had him bound. He was about to, to take his life. God held his hand. Stop. Listen to what God says to him. In chapter 22, he says, um, By myself I have sworn, said the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessings I will bless you, multiplying I will multiply you, your descendants as the stars of the heavens and as the sand on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. And in your seed, catch this, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Again, this was more than just Jesus coming. Even though that's huge, he was saying, my message is to the world. My message is not just to a particular people. It's to the world. Let's, let's see if we can confirm this a little bit more. Let's go to Exodus 19. Exodus 19, the children of Israel have come out of Egypt. They're in the wilderness. And here's Moses talking to God. And he says, 19.5, he says, um, 4. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people for all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This was his purpose. His purpose was to develop a people who represented his character, who represented his character. And if you read the next chapter, that's Exodus 20, what do you see there? The law. Now, people have trouble with this concept. Oh, when they think of the law, they think of, oh, this is the do's and the don'ts. But that's not how God sees it. The law is seen as his character. Because it's, it's about your relationship with God, and it's about your relationship with each other. Those are the two biggest things. How you treat each other, how you treat God. So God's interest now, God's interest was, um, was that he wanted his character manifested to the world. Let's, let's go to Deuteronomy now. The book of Deuteronomy was written to the children of the children of Israel. Do you get that? It was written to the children of the children of Israel. Because 40 years, 40 years prior to them coming to the, the, the border of, of Canaan, 40 years prior, they rebelled. Children of Israel rebelled. They would not go in. God told them to go in, take the land. I will, I will support you. I will make you into a, 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 I will give you the power to defeat these, these people. And they sent their spies in, and the spies gave a bad report. And, and when Moses and said, no, we need to go, they almost stoned him. God intervened and said, okay, we'll give you what you wish for. We'll send you back out into the wilderness. And so for the next 40 years, they wandered into, in the wilderness, and everybody over 20 died. Everybody over 20 died. So now they're back at the border. They're back at where they were before. And here is Moses now lecturing to this group. He's basically telling them, he's, he's going, he's reminiscing all the things that they'd gone through and all the things that, he, they had been, that they had seen so that they would not forget. Now, one of the things 
Well, let's look at this. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 1, and then I'm going to jump from 5 to 8. It says, Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your father has given you. Verse 5, Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding nation. As you go through Deuteronomy, there are multiple sites that talk about obey. Obey. You do, I will do. If you do this, I will do that. We look at uh, 439 and 40. Therefore know this day and consider in your heart that the Lord himself is God in heaven, above and on the earth beneath. There is no other. You shall therefore keep his statutes and his commandments which I command you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you. And that you may... I've got my paper. Sorry. Prolong your days in the, in the land which the Lord your God has given you for all, for all time. That was the promise. The Jews were never... They were never to be dethroned. They were supposed to make a nation... They were supposed to be moved. They were supposed to come into Canaan. They were supposed to be faithful. And then, they were be, they would, then God would bless them. God would just pour out more blessings. Let's look at their blessings that God promised them. Um, we look at um, chapter 7, verse 12. Then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the mercy which he swore to your fathers. And he will love you and bless you and multiply you. You will also, you will also bless the fruit of your wound. Oh, sorry. He will also bless the fruit of your wound, the fruit of your land, your grain, your new wine, your oil, the increase of your cattle, the offsprings of your flock, and the land which he swore to your fathers to give you. You shall be blessed of all, all, above all people. There shall not be a male or female barren among you or among your livestock. And the Lord will take away from you all sickness and will afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of, the, of Egypt, which you have known, but will lay them on those who hate you. God, I mean, God offers him more blessing and more blessings. We look at um, chapter 28, uh, verse 1, and it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today. That the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. All these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord. And then he goes to this list of blessings. If you live in a city, you'll be blessed. If you live in the country, you'll be blessed. If your cows will be blessed. If you have babies, you'll be blessed. If you, if you just make a dough, you'll be blessed. Every aspect of their life, they were, they were to be blessed. Now, why do you think God was going to do that? Why do you think God chose a people who he was going to bless like this? He said, you guys are my priesthood. You represent me to the world. That was the reason. He wanted people to come to his people and say, you guys, you guys are so blessed. What's going on? Who do you serve? Tell me more about this God that you serve. There were examples of this. You remember when Hezekiah was about to die? Hezekiah was the king of Judah in Isaiah 38. He was the king of Judah. He was about to die. He had lived a good life. He had done God, what God had told him to do. But God had told him, okay, your time is up. It's time for you. You're going to die. And he turned and he cried like a baby. And God gave him through Isaiah, came back and said, okay, I'll give you 15 more years. And he said, well, give me a sign. Give me a sign that you're going to do this. And so God then said, okay, I'll turn the clock back. That would be our time. He turned the sun back. 
Well, there were people in Babylon who were, who were astronomers and scientists, and they saw the sun go backward. That had never happened, ever. And they inquired and inquired and inquired, and they found out that this king in Judah, who was about to die, had a god who extended his life, and they wanted to know more about Humri, the God. How did that happen? How did that happen? So they get their little envoy, and they go, they go to Judah, and they see Hezekiah. And what does Hezekiah show them? The temple, God. It tells them, about, no. He shows them his stuff. He said, look at my stuff. I got all this gold. I'm the man. He shows him all this material stuff. He, and, and then Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah comes to him and said, who were those guys? He says, oh, some guys from a little, little country called Babylon. And, and Isaiah said, you know, see, what did you, what did you tell them? Instead of telling them about the Lord God, he told them about his stuff. He, he pushed up himself. And so Isaac said, Isaiah said, there's going to come a time when that little country is going to be a big country and they're going to come here and they're going to take every bit of gold and silver that you have. Not only that, and this is a prophecy because this was years before, not only that, they're going to take your sons and make eunuchs out of them. And you know that happened if you read the book of Daniel. You know that happened. Got to keep, got to look at my time here. So, one of the things I want to go back, I want to, I want to go back, uh, because it. Some people feel that the child, that the some people feel that people in the Old Testament were under a different covenant than us. This term is about the God's people. The whole purpose is to say God's people were the same then as they are now. We, we were under the same rules as they were. It's no different. I'm going to show you this. So when you read Deuteronomy, you hear about, I want you to, if you do this, if you do that, if you have, don't have other gods, then, then I will bless you, I will bless you, I will bless you. A lot of obey, obey, obey. And I thought, wow. That's, that's pretty legalistic, right? But then I read chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. And let's go back to that. In chapter 6, Moses, chapter 5, Moses gives the law to the children of Israel. Then in chapter 6, he expounds upon it. And this is huge. This really changed my look on things. I'm going to read it. Now, this is the commandments, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your father has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, this is, this is it right here. Verse 4 through 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I need to go on a tangent here just for a moment. In that time period, all these nations had their own God. They, and then some people would make their gods. they carve it out of a tree, put gold over it, and then bow to it. How silly is that? But everybody had their own gods just like 
we have our own, our own gods today. There's Confucius, there's Buddha, there's Muhammad. There's all kinds of different religions that people worship. But there's only one God. I don't care who you or what you worship. There's only one God. Now, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I still believe that. They're one God. And that one God, listen to me, says this. Verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I commanded you today shall be in your heart. Now this is huge. And the reason why this is huge, because all, this, all, this, all the time we, we read about, well, they didn't do this. That's why they, were, that's why they weren't obedient. They weren't obedient. That's why they were lost. That's not why they were lost. I mean, look at, look at um, Ephesians chapter 2. Paul writes this real quick. They were under the same rule. Ephesians chapter 2 says this. If I can get there real quick. Um, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourself it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Oh, so, so we are saved by the blood of the Lamb. Everybody agree? We are saved by the blood of the Lamb. But we are judged by our works. Listen. Hey, let, me, let me go through this. Let's go back now and try to understand what was being said here by Moses. Because Jesus repeated it in the New Testament. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. This is a command. Understand, understand the words of God here. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words I command you today to be in your heart. If these words are in your heart, what does that imply? You know, in the New Testament, we talk about the workings of the Holy Spirit. Well, let's, let's, let's expound on this a little bit. In Matthew 22, Jesus said the same thing. A, a lawyer came to him and said, which is the greatest commandments? And this is what Jesus said. He repeated Moses. He said, verse, uh, that's uh, 22, verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But understand what he's saying. You go, you mean I'm commanded to love God? How is that possible? How can, can, can I command my wife to love me? I can't. I can't. But listen to what Jesus says, even in John. John 14, John 14, Jesus is finishing. It's the last night before his crucifixion. He's with his disciples, and this is what he is saying. 14, 15, if you love me, what does it say? Keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. The element here, the difference, the difference is the love, the relationship. Let's build on that. He says, if you love me, keep my, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you 
and will be in you. What is Moses talking about? Having, having the love of God in your heart. What's he talking about here? Let's, let's, there's another text we could use. Verse 23 and 24, Jesus is answering Judas. He'd, he'd asked him a question, and he says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Did you catch that? He says, if you love me, if you love me and keep my word, my Father will love you, and both he and I will come and dwell in you. Now, what happens then when God's Spirit is in us? What happens? We're changed, right? What we, and what do we naturally do? Because he is living in us. We live the law because the law is his character. Does that make sense? Yeah. We naturally live the law because the law is his character. The law is broken down to your, your responsibility to God and your responsibility to fellow man. It's not about don't do this, don't do that. It's about relationship. And so if we have this relationship with God, then we naturally, naturally will keep the law. Jeremiah 31, 33 says, well, let's read it. Try to quote it and then I'll mess it up. Okay, Jeremiah, let's find that real quick. This is in Hebrews also 8, but Jeremiah 31, 38. Here's, here's um, listen to this, because they talk about a new covenant. People get caught up on this new and old covenant. But if you study that, the only difference in the new and the old covenant is not the law. Listen to this. He says, Behold, the days are coming, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers and the day that I took them by the hand and to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, said the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after these days, said the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. That people sometimes look at that and say, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. That is not writing the law on the heart. It's the relationship. He says that I will dwell with you. I will put my spirit in you, and I will change you. I will change you. So, almost, I got a few more minutes. Hang on. So we go back now to the Old, to the Old Testament. We see the children of Israel. There are 12 tribes. You know, after Solomon, uh, the tribes broke up into uh, two different nations, uh, Judah and Benjamin were a nation, and then the 10 tribes became a nation within themselves. Jeroboam became their king. He, got, he was afraid. He was afraid that um, the people were going to go back to Jerusalem. So he, he didn't, and Bethel and Dan, he makes this golden image. He, put, he makes this temple, and he induces them into this idolatrous relationship. God chose him. That's what's amazing to me. Didn't God know that this guy was going to do that? But God chose him. That's what they did. Every time you read about the Israelites, it's he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did evil. And this is the kings. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. And it got to the point where other nations started invading them. The Assyrians became very big. 
and pretty soon they overran the 10 tribes of Israel. And they took them <clears throat> and mixed them into their people. That's why they don't exist today. You know that? That's why they don't exist. The only ones that exist are the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. But Judah started to have kings that were evil. Good, evil, good, evil. In fact, there were times when they were more evil than good. This is a time when Isaiah and Jeremiah, they're preaching to the people. They're saying, hey, follow the Lord. Follow the Lord. And they were being, they were being condemned. So it came to a time where God said, enough is enough. And God said, okay, it's time for Judah to go into captivity. For what they could not learn when they were open and free on their own, they will learn in captivity. So one of the interesting, I got five minutes, just give me five minutes here. So one of the most interesting things then about Daniel, and one day I do really need to go over Daniel 1, 2, 3, because this is not it. One of the most rich, really interesting things is when they, when King Nebuchadnezzar, who was really a brilliant man, when he took over, he took brilliant kids from every nation and he brought them into his kingdom and then he indoctrinated them. You know, with Daniel, Meshach, I mean, Meshach, Abednego, those are all, uh, Daniel's a Hebrew's name, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those are uh, Babylonian names. I think their real names were Hananiah, uh, Mishael, and Azariah. The whole purpose of him changing their names was to induce them into his religion because he felt that his God was better. He proved it. He, he beat them. But you know, God had a different plan. The people who came into captivity in Babylon was a mixture of people who were following God and those who were not following God. They were all Jews. They were all Jews. So, so this is, let me make this point. So when they were captured and brought in, it says Daniel, we need to get to this. Daniel purposed in his heart that he was going to follow God. He purposed in his heart that he was going to follow God. That was huge. You know, if, there, if Daniel hadn't done that, we wouldn't have the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel has convict, convicted atheists, converted atheists, because it told the future of, of hundreds of years ahead, and nobody can refute that. The Bible is the only book that said this is going to happen, and it happened just as predicted. It's the only book that's, convic that's convicted me. I'm sold. So if that happened, and he tells me that in the future, this is going to happen to us. Where are we now as God's people? All right. We're, we're in the same boat that they were in then. When, when they brought all those kids in. And they said, okay, I'm going to give you the king's uh, wine, and I'm going to and I have you eat from the king's table. Daniel said, no, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to not do that. All right? And he and his buddies stood up. They purposed in their heart. All right? They decided before that's what they were going to do in the future. We don't know how, how, how far ahead that is. That's going to happen to us. Some of us are living as though... How can I put this? Let me stop. Some of us live just like those who lived outside the will of God did. They eat, they drink, they party, just like the world and under the delusion that when everything hits the fan, you're going to stand. Unless you're standing now, you're not going to stand. Unless you've 
purposed in your heart now? It is not all of a sudden going to, you're not going to say, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, <laughs> you're going you're gonna to succumb. You're going to give in. People start talking about killing your family and you're not going to, you're not going to. You're not going to stand unless you're standing now. Unless God is taking you through that journey now, you're not going to be able to do it. So when does that journey start? Now. That's right. Is it going to happen? Absolutely. Because everything in Daniel has already happened. Not everything. But we're living in a time of revelation. Daniel, revelation, their book ends. And everything has been true. Everything. So I've got to end this real quick, real quick. I'm sorry. One more thing. So what happened to those Hebrew boys? Okay. There's a reason why this story is in the Bible. Verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. An expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they... Heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to build Shadrach, to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. These men were bound in their coats and trousers and turbans and outer garments. That was done deliberate so that he could inflict more pain. Your clothes catch on fire. You can't get your clothes off. You were going to burn slowly, but you are going to burn. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fires killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the, fiery, midst of the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king. He said, Look. And he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Now, that was a supernatural revelation. That didn't just happen. So he calls him out. He comes to the entrance to the, of, the, of the furnace. He says, hey, guys, come on out. And so they came up. And listen, he calls. It says here, let's read that. It says, uh, I got to read what he says. He says, servants of the most high God, come out and come here. That's amazing. You know Nebuchadnezzar is going to be in heaven. That's a study. We need to study that. He's going to be in heaven. And all, all these people who, who had bowed, they came. They came and they looked. And they, they, they couldn't even smell smoke on them. The only thing that was consumed was the thing that bound, they're binding. That was the only thing that was burned. And of course... Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's words and yielded their bodies that they should not serve any, or worship any god except their own god. We are going to go through our own fiery furnace. We may not be delivered like that, but without a doubt, God will be with us. His presence, he'll be standing there with us. He will be. And that's our hope. That's our hope. See, all these things that are coming up is scary. You know, what am I going to do? I, I love my kids. I love my grandkids. Can you imagine somebody threatening, threatening to kill them if I don't conform? But now is the time to determine within my heart that no matter what happens, I'm going to serve God. And he is going to give me the strength to go through that. And he's going to give that to you too. But we have to remember, the process starts now. Now is the time 
that we're learning how to fight, how to resist the devil, how to push him away. Now is the time. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we're not ready. I'm not ready. I don't know if I can stand. But you know. But it won't be on any strength of my own. It'll be through the power of you living in me. So we're asking, Lord, that you'll begin that transforming process now. For us to be able to stand, you have to live in us. You and the Father, as you said in your word, that you would live in us, that you would help us to stand. Lord, live in us, help us to stand, help us to be ready when you come. In Jesus' name.